so hi, uh, I'm Victor Banks, and I'm presenting a joint work together with Eike Hülemeyer about multi arm balance with censored consumption of resources. So let's start with a motivating example for our paper. Let's assume we have three algorithms available. And in, yeah, in a sequential manner, we are provided with data sets and we have to choose in each uh, round one of the three algorithms to solve this uh, problem instance. And the goal is actually to pick in each round the most suitable machine learning model. And well, the question is, which of the three here should be picked? And it seems that this is quite obvious because, well, we should uh, pick the one which is performing best. Yeah? So we can, uh, for instance, look at the performance average over previous runs and see, for instance, here, this uh, neural network here has the highest performance. And obviously, we should pick that one. But what happens if we also take into account that we also have resources, yeah, which we need to keep uh, an eye on? Uh, for instance, if we look at the CPU time, then the picture is a bit different because more complex models, of course, need more resources, yeah, so more CPU time, and more simpler models need fewer resources, yeah, so here this polynomial regression has a low CPU time. And why is this relevant? This is relevant if we look, for instance, at the workload manager, where we uh, submit a job, now yeah, here with a Slurm example, yeah, where we have to provide, for instance, the CPU time or the memory consumption for an algorithm which we want to run. And what happens if we choose the resources too low? We don't uh, benefit from the performance at all because the job will be eliminated and we don't see performance for the data set and it is unsolved in some cases. Yeah, so the question is, well, how can we um, kind of combine the two, yeah, a good performance and also um, choose the resources in an appropriate way so that we can benefit from the performance. And this is what we did in our um, paper. So first of all, we asked, well, how can we model such uh, problems, such a decision-making problem on a more general way? And then in a second step, how to solve it. All right. And in order to model it, we resort to the so-called stochastic Martian balance. Uh, just a quick recap: what these, what, what this type of problem is. So there, we also have a sequential decision-making problem where we have yeah, n many slot machines or one-armed bandits, which are representing choice alternatives. Yeah, so take the the algorithms before, and in each of the time steps we have to decide which of the slot machines, which of the one arm bandits we want to pull to play. This is our action. And once we decided to choose one of them, yeah, so here, for instance, the second slot machine is played, we obtain a reward. Yeah? So this um, slot machine we picked is generating a reward. And how is the reward? Uh, generated well, we have here the stochastic setting so that behind every slot machine there is an unknown reward distribution, and the reward we obtain is nothing else than a noisy uh, sample from the underlying reward distribution. And of course, uh, the slot machine we use yeah, in one time step is the single one which we can use. Yeah, so it's not possible to choose multiple at one time so that we do not observe rewards of slot machines we haven't played. And the typical goal in this scenario is to find out as quickly as possible which of these slot machines of these one arm panels is generating the highest reward on average. Yeah, so it's kind of a stateless reinforcement learning problem. All right, and we have extended this simple setting yeah, in order to also take into account these resources I was talking about. And for this purpose, we assume in addition to the reward distributions behind the slot machines, 
We have also um, distributions regarding the consumption of resources. And additionally, the action is now consisting of two parts. So we don't only choose one slot machine. We, in addition, have to choose a resource limit. And yeah, for instance, we uh, choose the second uh, slot machine here and also decide to provide how many resources. And once we have decided on this action, yeah, the difference is that we don't necessarily observe the reward when we play it. We only observe it when we have provided enough resources. Yeah, so the second arm here, the second slot machine is generating a noisy resource consumption. And if and only if our resources are higher than this consumption, we obtain the reward. So in the other case, when we have provided not enough resources, we don't see any reward at all. But we still have a valuable information, namely we have a right sensor observation. We know that the consumption of the second arm was at least higher than the resources we had provided. All right, and now the question is, well, uh, what is the best action we can do with each round? And in order to model this in a suitable way, we make the following assumption. So we have a resource limit, calligraphic M, as a subspace of uh, the interval zero to tau max, so a maximal resource limit. We have also a cost function, which is mapping the resource consumption to the same unit as the rewards, you know, so that we can compare the two with each other. And in addition, we have a penalty function lambda, which yeah, penalize if we exceed, uh, exceed the resources in some run. And with this together, we can specify a term, which is representing the suitability, yeah, the, the quality of an action, of an arm resource pair. And this is this difference we see here on uh, the display, the map display. And in a nutshell, it's nothing else than an expected profit minus an expected loss. Yeah? So an expected gain. And with this, we can specify quite easily what a best action is. Yeah, an arm resource pair, namely the one which is maximizing the expected gain. And the goal is eventually to construct a learner, yeah, so a strategy over time, which is doing actions, yeah, so choosing arm resource pairs, such that the cumulative regret is low over the capital T many rounds. All right, so we have now seen how we can model this decision-making problem in the beginning. Now we come to how to solve it. And here we have um, considered two cases. The one case is where we have that uh, resource limit is consisting of M many predefined resource limits. This will be also the focus of this talk. And for the second one, we don't have the time, unfortunately. So again, we have this expected gains definition, which is specifying whether an action is optimal or suboptimal. So in order to do an optimal action, we need to find out how these expected gain uh, are looking for different actions. Yeah, so we need to estimate those. All right, so um, also due to time constraints, I can uh, not get into the details for the estimate we have um, for the expected gain. So it's consisting of two parts. Yeah? So the one part is um, estimating the first expected value we see there. Yeah? This hat GIT is um, for the first expected value we see there in the expected gain. And this hat lambda term is for the second part. And um, the interesting thing about these estimates is, yeah, we have 
nice update formulas, even though when we have censored observations. Yeah? So this is in contrast to a simple plug-in estimator, which would be the most natural thing to do, yeah? where we don't update every resource for a specific arm. Yeah? For our estimate, it's possible to update along the entire resource sequence yeah, for the given arm we have used, yeah, which is uh, quite nice for the inference. In addition, we can also specify how good our estimates are, and we can specify this via concentration inequalities, which give rise to a confidence bound. Yeah? So we can uh, determine a confidence bound such that the value we want to estimate, the expected gains, yeah, they are contained in a confidence bound, which is um, covering it with high probability, which increases with the number of uh, rounds we have yeah, with the T. And once we have this confidence bound, um, once we have these confidence bounds, we can resort to a learning strategy quite often used in the Bennett literature, namely the UCD policy which is essentially telling, yeah, well, choose the action which has the highest upper confidence bound, yeah, so the UCB value. And in our case, the action consists, once again, of two parts, an arm and a resource limit. And, well, we have for all arms and resource limits, we have such an upper confidence bound, and we choose the one with the highest one. And due to the um, setting we consider, we call this strategy the resource censored UCB, RC, UCB for short. All right, to have an illustration uh, and intuition how this works, let's consider the following simple example. So we have two arms and two resource limits. Yeah, so action, uh, so arm A1, A2, and two resource limits tau1, tau2. Yeah, you see here in red the true expected gains, new i, tau. So we see the optimal action would be to choose R A1 with resource limit tau2. And on the right-hand side in the histogram, we keep track of how many times we have used an action. So after choosing the first uh, action, yeah, R1 and resource limits tau1, we have an update for the estimate, the blue point, and the others are um, initialize at zero. After six rounds, yeah, the picture might be like this. So the estimates are yeah, close, but not very close to the actual values they should estimate, but the confidence bounds are such that the uh, true values are covered. And then yeah, when we uh, run the algorithm, it will do the following, yeah, so it will, depending on the upper confidence bounds, choose from time to time one suboptimal action, but in most cases, as we see here, the optimal action yeah, arm one and resource then tau two will be the one which is most often used. So this one is also quite often used because the true expected gains are quite close to each other. Okay, we have also analyzed this algorithm theoretically, and uh, our theoretical guarantees show that the regret of our suggested algorithm is actually bounded by the regret of a naive uh, usage of the UCB algorithm, where we would simply look at each arm resource there as a meter arm, yeah, and then run the UCB algorithm on that. And this regret is uh, diminished by a logarithmic term from the time horizon. We also have considered empirically how this algorithm performs, and we have considered their different uh, scenarios on the correlation or dependence between the resource consumption and reward distribution, so positive correlation, negative correlation, independence, and in all cases, we see that our algorithm is performing 
way better yeah, because it's uh, more suitable to learn the structure, the dependency between the two distributions. All right, yeah, so to wrap up, we have seen how to model such a decision-making problem where we also need to specify resource limits. And uh, we have seen how to solve it for the case where the resource limits are consisting of M many predefined resource points. So if you're interested in the second uh, way where the resource limits are quite general, yeah, come to the poster session or look at our paper or even better, do both. Thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> Good question. Would you mind that? Absolutely. Hi, thank you very much. I have a uh, clarifying question. So it also depends on which function you choose for C and lambda, and right? And does the proof also depend on that? And how do you choose them? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yes. So the, um, of course, the, these functions, the cost functions and the penalty functions, they uh, specify actually whether we have, uh, also, so what are the expected gains in the end. And uh, in the proofs, it's, I mean, the proof is more or less uh, depending on the gap we get from these expected gains. Yeah. So the expected gains, these are the target values kind of. And for these target values, we get gaps. Yeah? So uh, the best one minus the ones which are chosen. Yeah? And they are then popping up in the proofs. Yeah? So in the Bennett literature, you have uh, usually these deltas yeah? where you look at the expected average in, in the common case. Here, we simply substitute these uh, average rewards by the expected gains. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting. So uh, just curious about your uh, theoretical analysis of uh, the regret. So uh, you mentioned that your regret of RCUCP is bounded by its uh, regret of naive UCP, right? Yeah. Uh, so just curious that uh, what you mean by naive UCP and uh, yeah. what the regret of it? Uh, particularly, uh, is that going to scale with the number of uh, resource you have, or scale with the? Uh, so what is, I mean, I mean, what the particular form, the constant, of this event, UCB, and UCB. Right. So um, the UCB here would be really a naive uh, application of the UCB, where you simply look at every possible combination between arm and resource as a yeah, meter arm. Yeah, so this is then one once again specifying an arm which you can choose. Yeah, so look at it as a matrix kind of. Yeah, so in the rows you have the resource limits and the columns you have the possible arms. Yeah, and each uh, entry is then giving you a combination. Yeah, and each of these entries are then considered as arms on which you can uh, run the UCB algorithm on its own. And you can analyze it, how the regret will look like. This is what we have done in the paper. Yeah? And the uh, regret would be simply the sum over all possible uh, arms, yeah? where you multiply the gaps coming from the expected gains times the uh, logarithm of the time horizon. Okay, very good uh, work. Uh, I think your target is uh, to decrease the resources, the model use, I think. And I, uh, I want to ask my question is, have you have tried to uh, make these arms to communicate with each other to, uh, to, reduce, to, to decrease the resources? Well, I think that your arms is independent with each other. Exactly. 
So, so, so you have, have you tried to make some communicate with each other? I think this may uh, decrease your time cost or the resources. No, we haven't, but uh, so, so no, we haven't, um, but we would also need to assume something on the structure, how they depend. So like a copulas or something on the distributions, right? And so right now we have kind of like the independence copula. There's no dependence between the arms. So there's only a dependence between uh, arms or the reward distributions and their corresponding consumption of resource distributions. But uh, for the first uh, part, so uh, I want to comment, it's not uh, exactly the goal to limit the resource limits. Yeah, so it might be also tempting to provide more resource limits when the gain in reward is high enough. Yeah? This is captured by the expected gain, of course. Yeah? So it depends on the underlying uh, task we have. Uh, but it's not necessary that we want to push down the resource limits. Yeah, so we have we have a trade-off. We want to have both. Yeah, so keep the uh, reward consumption low, but still have a reasonable high reward. Thank you. I will go on to the next talk. Just in the sake of time.